Hey church family, so happy to be with you today as we kick off Church at Home in 2021. We're really excited and expectant for what the Lord is going to do this year. Whether you're joining us on one of our live broadcasts or watching later on in the week, we want to say welcome. We are so glad to be with you. We've got a great morning full of worship and learning from God's Word planned for you. Really fired up to jump into that, but why don't we start by dedicating our time to the Lord together this morning. Would you join me as I pray? Lord, we are so grateful to walk into a brand new year that you have given us, Lord. We are so excited, expecting what you were going to do. God, there's so much anticipation, Lord, to see you move. And so I pray that you would start right here, right now, Lord, through this time of worship, through the words, through the message that we're going to hear. Lord, would you speak to us in a brand new way? We are excited, Lord, to hear what you have for us. We dedicate this moment, this space, and this year to you. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
such a blessing to get to worship together as a family. Well, church, as we jump into this week's announcements, I just want to start by saying that we are so glad that you're here with us today. If you're new or visiting us for the first time, please don't leave without getting connected. There are always a ton of opportunities to get plugged into the family here at Captivate. Your best bet is to stop by the welcome bar after each service. There you can meet some new friends, find out about our many different communities and cores, sign up for our weekly newsletter. 
But one of the best ways that you can get plugged in is on one of our many serve teams. And that's because we believe that you grow the most alongside others and on mission. There's no better place to do that than on our serve teams. If you've been waiting to jump in, there's no better time than now as we kick off 2021. We've got all sorts of teams from our welcome home team to our tech team that helps produce our Sunday gatherings to our kids team that pours into our next generation of leaders. Whatever you're interested in, we've got a place for you. Sign up at the welcome bar after service. And next week, we're starting our brand new series, Unmixed, about what it truly looks like to be set apart. We'll also have a brand new devotional journal for you at, to track along together throughout this series. Super excited about that. We'll also be starting a church-wide 21 days of prayer and fasting. There are many different ways that you can fast, whether that's food, television, social media. We know that fasting is identifying what it is in your life that you hunger for and reallocating that hunger to the Lord. Can't wait to come together as one family and experience God move. And finally, church, we want to thank you for your continued generosity through your partnership with us this year, we were able to experience some truly incredible things. Together we saw over 400 people in communities, started 44 Corps, sent out our first missionaries, and saw over 100 people say yes to Jesus. Truly amazing, and we could not have done it without you. Thank you for your faithfulness. If you've been blessed by the ministry here at Captivate, we'd ask that you consider giving this morning. As always, you can give in the black giving boxes on the way out or online at CaptivateSD.com. Again, so glad that you're with us this morning. We hope that this message blesses and encourages you. Church, you made it. I made it. We're all here. It feels so good to have you joining us for our first service of 2021. And it feels good to just say we're starting a new year, doesn't it? And I think we can say that because we all know what last year was. Right, if anything, last year, 2020, it was hard. And maybe for some of you, it was the hardest year of your life. But if I were to try and sum up last year with one word, it would have to be with the word loss. Because I believe we all experienced loss in some capacity. Maybe for you, you actually experienced the loss of a job or the loss of some financial security. Or maybe you feel like you lost some motivation to go after the things that you were going after in life. Or maybe like a lot of people, you experienced the loss of a loved one. Look, you, some of those or all of those you might have experienced last year, but it doesn't change the fact that, again, we all experienced some loss in 2020. But here's the thing. I think those losses, they were exaggerated because they go against what our hopes and expectations were for last year. Right? Think real quick about last January. Where were we at? Things on the outside of life, they were really good. Right? The economy, it was thriving. People were working. We had record low unemployment numbers. The stock market, your 401k, your savings, it was probably at brand new all-time highs. Things were really good at the end of 2019. For us as a church, God, he was blowing us away with what he was doing. We were ministering to over 1,000 people each and every weekend. And we had, we had over 40 small groups meeting throughout San Diego County. And we were able to buy this multi-million dollar property in less than a year. Like, it's crazy. That stuff, it doesn't happen every day. Again, what, what God was doing, it was amazing. What we were seeing on the outside of our lives at the end of 2019, it was good. And maybe if you were like me, you thought it was only the beginning. Maybe you were at the point where you thought 2020, that might be the beginning of the best decade of my life. But again, it didn't go as we thought it would, right? And that's the thing when it comes to life. When life doesn't go according to the narrative you believed in, it can shock you. Not only that, but when, when life doesn't go according to the narrative that you believed in, it can paralyze you. Like you're not exactly sure what might be next because you missed so badly on what just happened to you. But that's the thing. The narrative you choose to believe in for your own life, for who you are, for what your life is about, for who your God is and what he's capable of doing. Again, these narratives you choose to believe about your own life, they impact the rest of your life because your beliefs, they influence all that you do. For example, I'm assuming some of you know what CrossFit is. For those of you who don't know what CrossFit is, CrossFit is essentially some of the best athletes in the world and what they do is, is they work out. That's their job. Their job description literally is pain. Their, their job is to become the best at working out. I know it's interesting. It can be described as a little bit crazy, but they're also the best athletes in the entire world. But in the world of CrossFit, again, the best athletes, the most fit athletes in the whole world, they have this saying. They have this saying that they call the 40% rule. What the 40% rule means is that as they're in their, these workouts, they're pushing their body to the max. At some point in the workout, their mind is gonna tell them that they're done, that they need to stop. 
But the 40% rule tells them that they're not done, that they need to keep going because their body, in actuality, it's only at about 40% of its potential. Or in other words, your mind, what you believe about yourself, again, it influences what you're actually able to do and accomplish. And it makes me think, in a thing like working out, if your mind shuts off its belief about a physical thing, something that you can see and something that you can sense so early, then I'd only assume that our mind would tend to shut off its belief when it comes to the things that we can't see, when it comes to the spiritual components of life. But that's why I love how we're starting off this year, this service, in each and every service, and that's starting it off with some worship, with singing and praising. But that's the thing about worship, praising and singing. That's what we've been doing this morning, but that's only one part of worship. That's only one act of it. Because you could see the Bible, it defines worship not so much as an act like singing and, and praising, but it describes worship more as a condition of your heart. John 4, Jesus, he tells us that true worshipers of his aren't the ones that have the best vocalist skills or the ones that are best on the guitar, but he tells us that his true worshipers, true worshipers are, of God, are the ones who worship him in spirit and in truth. Or in other words, according to Jesus, Worship to him is simply being in the presence of God and letting his truth, the truth, change you. Because that's the thing. Worship, when worship is grounded in his truth, it has a way of bringing you back and reminding you of the narrative that he has for your life. And I think part of that narrative is regardless of what you might face, regardless of how hard that moment may feel right now in your life, that this narrative of who God is doesn't change. That your God, he's still on his throne. That your God, he's still the king of kings. And that your God and his love for you, it's not dependent upon temporary circumstances. You see, worship changes you because worship, it'll shift your focus from the problem in front of you to the answer that can be found within you, which is Jesus. Again, worship, it has a way of changing you. It changes you because it changes the narrative you believe about yourself, about your life, and about God. That's why I'm excited to share with you today a message that I've entitled New Year, New Narrative. Again, New Year, New Narrative, because by the end of this, I hope that you see that the narrative that God has for you in your life, not only is a narrative that's worth believing in, but it's actually the only one you were meant to live your life from. Because look, next week, I'm so excited, we're starting a brand new series here at Captivate. We're gonna be calling it Unmixed. Unmixed, because that's the thing, God, he's calling you, he's calling me. He's calling for all of our lives to be different to be different from society, to stand out, to be unmixed, to be different from the person next to you who may not know God. Why is he asking for your life to be different? Because the truth is our world, it needs a light. Our world, it needs a guide that's leading it somewhere different, somewhere deeper, somewhere more divine. And what might that light be? We believe that that light, it's an unmixed church. It's an unmixed people that illuminates the beauty and transformation that takes place when you say yes to Jesus when you live with the heart of worship and you give him the throne of your heart. But I'm telling you right now, if your narrative isn't right, if what you believe again about yourself, about your life and about your God, if that's not founded on truth, then I don't really think you'll see nor experience any of the change that God is wanting to bring into your life. And you might be thinking, that's a little harsh, Sam. Like, why do you believe that? And I say, I believe that because that's exactly what God's word says. Look what Paul writes in Romans 12 too. Romans 12 too, it's a verse that probably a lot of you know. It might be a verse that someone has a tattoo of right now as they're watching. But Romans 12 too, Paul, he writes this. He says, stop intimidating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you. In other words, be different, but be inwardly transformed. He's saying be changed, but be changed how? He says, by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Or in other words, by changing what you actually believe. He goes on to end the verse like this. It says, this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, one that's satisfying and perfect in his eyes. You see, in this verse, Paul, he tells us, you wanna see real change in your life. You wanna see this beautiful transformation take place in your life, a change that not only impacts you, but changes the world around you, impacts the people around you. You wanna see that type of change in your life. He's saying it doesn't come from you. It's not gonna be sourced from you. It doesn't come from, from your willpower and wanting to be a better person. It doesn't come from setting new, new Year's resolutions and hitting those. No, he says real change, lasting change. It comes by changing the way that you think. It comes by changing the narrative you believe about yourself, about your life, 
and about God. So today I want to share with you three points. Three things I think we all need to know when it comes to believing and living from the narrative that God has for you in your life. So that we can all make the most of 2021. So today we're going to be in Acts 16. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Acts 16 verses 22 through 31. But speaking of this beautiful life that Paul was talking about in that verse in Romans, you get one that's satisfying and pleasing to God in every way. If, 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 if any generation of the church were ever to have lived up to that verse, I would say it'd have to be the first generation, the first generation of Christians. Because you see this first generation of believers or followers of Jesus, they didn't have multi-million dollar buildings that they could walk into and just feel inspired to worship God with. They didn't have that at all. But rather, rather than not having that, what they had is they had persecution. They had persecution in ways that we have never seen or probably experienced in our own lives. For them, life on the outside, it was hard. It was challenging. In fact, not only were they being arrested and thrown into prison for their faith, but in fact, some of them were actually being killed for their faith. <laughs> if you look at the 12 disciples, Jesus had 12 disciples it's known that only one of them actually lived a life and then died of natural causes. We all know that that's not a good ratio, right? Again, the outside of their lives for this first generation of believers, it was challenging. It was hard. But it didn't phase them. And I believe it didn't phase them because I believe that they knew the narrative that God had for their life. That again, he had made them to be different. He had made them to stand out. He had made them to be unmixed. So today... We're going to be reading about one of the harder moments in the lives of Paul and Silas. Again, two of the guys who are part of this first generation of believers. But before we jump in, I want to give you some context. So Paul and Silas, they're doing exactly what God has called them to do. They're on a mission trip, basically. They're going from town to town. They're sharing the gospel. They're doing miracles. God is doing miracles through them. They're healing people. They're casting out demons. And the Bible tells us they get to this one town. They get to this one town and they cast out this demon from this woman. But then the Bible tells us that the leaders, the people high up in that city, they did not like this. They did not like this because they saw that Paul and Silas, again, they were changing lives by the thousands. And they did not like change. Why do people in power not like change? Because it threatens their power. So the people high up in the city, they start getting mad at Paul and Silas. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. Again, Acts 16, verse 22, this is what the Bible says. It says, a mob, it quickly formed against Paul and Silas. In the city officials, they ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer, he put them into the inner, inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. And I can't help but think how brutal, right? They're doing all that God is calling for them to do, and what happens? They get beaten and thrown into prison. But if anything, the first few verses of this story, I think what it shows us when it comes to the narrative that God wants you to believe about your own life is this, is that following Jesus, it's not always easy. It's not. Look, as much as I wish I could tell you that as soon as you say yes to Jesus, that life on the outside, it gets good. No, that life on the outside, it gets perfect that when you say yes to Jesus. As much as I like to tell you that, I can't. And the reason that I can't is because that's not what Jesus tells us. In fact, one of the last things he says to his followers before he's arrested and crucified is found in John 16, He says this again to his followers. He said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. I love how Jesus, he quantifies it for us, right? Not a couple, not a few, but many trials and sorrows. But he goes on to say this. He says, but take heart, take heart because I have overcome the world again. Looking at what Jesus is telling us right now, he's saying this, he's saying, this isn't heaven. Where you find yourself right now, life, it's not heaven. It's gonna be hard, but it's important that you know that. Again, one of the last thing he says to his followers, why is it important that you know that? Because if you're not aware that life, it's still hard even after saying yes to him, then the hardships, the trials you face, they're gonna push you away from God. They're gonna drive you away from God because if you don't know this truth, and you begin to believe this and live from it, then you're gonna begin to, to, to live in the lives that Satan is gonna feed you as you face these trials. Lies about yourself, lies about maybe how God sees you. For example, getting back to the story, if I didn't know this truth that, that life, it's still gonna be hard after saying yes to Jesus, and I found myself in Paul and Silas' situation, I myself, I probably would have gotten mad at God. 
I've been like, what the heck, God? Like, we were doing everything you called us to do. We, it was going amazing. You were doing some incredible things. Lives were being changed. Why am I being beaten by wooden rods and why am I being thrown into prison? Like, this can't be part of your plan. If I didn't know that truth, it'd be so easy for me to think that way to get mad, to get offended, to get upset at what was happening to me, to get upset at God. And if it wasn't that thought process, then maybe it'd be something along these lines. Maybe he's thinking of something like, oh, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I sinned in a certain way. Maybe God, he's just punishing me. God, do you maybe love me less than you did the day before? Look, I'm telling you, it's so easy to go there. It's so easy to go there if the narratives of what you believe about your own life, if they're not founded on truth. It's so easy to believe the lies of Satan, the ones that he'll throw at you because you won't have the truth to confront them with. Because when you know this truth, when you know that the bad things that happen to us in life, it's not because you did anything bad or it's not because that God, he's mad at you. But as Jesus tells us, again, it's just a part of life. It's a part of the world we find ourselves in. When you believe that and you live from that narrative, these hard things that you face, they won't push you away from God, but they'll do the opposite. They'll actually draw you closer to him. They'll push you closer to him because these hardships, these trials that we all face, they'll actually become an opportunity. That's what it tells us in James 1. They'll become an opportunity again to acknowledge simply your need for him in your life right now. Because you see it's through the hardships you face that your faith is built. Look, in Hebrews 11:6, it tells us you want to know how to live a life that's pleasing to God? It doesn't say you need to live a life that's marked with success. It doesn't tell us you need to live a life in which you have a ministry that impacts millions of people. No, it tells us this. You want to live a life that's pleasing to God? It's a life that's based on faith. That's it. That's what it tells us. But you know what's required for faith to actually exist? Is doubt. Doubt is required for faith to exist. It literally is. You cannot have the option of faith if doubt is not present. You see, doubt, it's literally required to build your faith, but also to build your relationship with God. And what does God say in this verse, again, right before he promises hardships and trials? He says this, he says, I tell you this so that you have my peace. You have my peace. See, as you grow in your faith and your relationship with him, many times you grow in the hardships and the trials. You begin to experience more and more of his fruit in your life, more of his comfort, more of his security, more of his peace, even in the midst of the more difficult and trying times that you'll face. And that's exactly what we see with Paul and Silas in our story. Because look how they respond. Respond to be, again, thrown into the deepest, darkest part of the prison. Verse 25 says this. It says, around midnight, Paul, Silas, they were praying and singing hymns to God. That was their, their response, to pray and to sing hymns. And the other prisoners, they were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Again, it's almost shocking to read that their response was to praise and worship God. But that leads us to point two of understanding the narrative that God has for you in your life. And that's this, is you were made to worship. You were made to worship. And I need to be clear, it's, it, it, you were made to worship, not to be worshiped, right? And I want you to think real quick, are you not worshiping something every single day? Think about it. Are you not worshiping something every single day? I'd say we definitely are. I'd say we for sure are because, again, worship is so much more than just praising and singing, but essentially worship, it's asking this question of yourself, who is Lord of my life? Or in your day-to-day, -day, who are you living your life for? Look, I believe we are all made to worship, and I believe this because the Bible, it tells us very little about what heaven will be like. But it makes one thing very clear, that all the people in heaven, they'll be doing one thing, and that's praising and worshiping God. Praising and worshiping God for all of eternity. And we know eternity is a really long time, right? So again, you are made for worship. God, he's instilled it within you. And maybe you're hearing this and it's making sense and you're agreeing with it. But now you might be asking this question, how do, how do I know who or what I'm actually worshiping? Like, who, are, who am I actually devoting my life to? Well, I think Paul and Silas they actually show us, they show us how we can clearly identify where our worship is going, where your worship is going. Because what they show us in this story is this, is that you will worship the things where you believe your answer will come from. Again, you will worship the things where you believe your answer will come from. So what or who do you look to most often for your answers? Maybe some days it's your bank account. Maybe other days it's the approval of the people around you. Or maybe if you're like me, on most days it's yourself, 
right? But for Paul and for Silas, they knew the answer for their life and even this particular situation. It wasn't gonna be found in money, the favor of others, or even themselves, but it became clear that through their worship, by praising God, even in the most challenging moment of their entire life, it proved that they believed that their answer for their life was Jesus. And they not only believed this for themselves, but they actually believed it for everybody around them. Because look how the story ends. Verse 27 says this. It says, the jailer, he woke up to see the prison doors were wide open. He assumed all the prisoners had escaped, so he drew a sword to kill himself. But Paul, he shouted, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer, he called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And that actually leads us to our third and final point. Point three of understanding the narrative that God has for you in your life is this, is that Jesus is and always will be your answer. Again, Jesus is and always will be your answer. Like that's it, nothing more. That's it. Don't you love how simple the gospel is? Like, it doesn't matter the problem you might be facing right now. I know that the answer, it's gonna be in Jesus, right? It's not gonna be found in some Instagram post or on a YouTube video. You're, you're not gonna find your answer in a self-help book or from some motivational speaker. But every single time, your answer is and always will be Jesus. For example, just this last week, my son, five years old, He's in the stage of life where he loves to ask questions. He asks a lot of questions right now. So this last week, it happened to be raining, right? And he comes up to me, he's like, Dad, why is it raining? <laughs> I look at him like, I think to myself, I, I don't know this. Like, I don't know the science behind it, let alone I don't know why it rains today and not any other days. But I basically told him this. I said, hey, bud, I don't know the answer to that. You're going to have to ask God about that. And when I told him that, he had somewhat of a puzzled look on his face. And he began to think about it for, for another few seconds. And then he asked me this question. He's like, so when I ask God, will I hear his voice? <laughs> and I love his follow-up question. But I told him this. I told him, you won't necessarily hear him in your ear, but you will hear him in your heart. And then he asked me one more question. One more question. He says this. He says, how will I know when he speaks to my heart? How will I know when he speaks to my heart? And maybe you've wondered the same thing. And what I told him was this, is that I said, you know it's God speaking to a, your heart. When you go to him in sincerity, when you go to him with expecting a response to the question, whatever the question might be, right? For him, it was a question about the weather. For you, it might be a question of whether to take the job opportunity that's in front of you or not. Or maybe it's a question you have about how can I uh, make amends to this relationship, this broken relationship in my life. Or maybe it's a question as simply of where should I take the family out to eat tonight? It doesn't matter what it is. It just matters, again, that you go to God and then you not only expect, but you believe that he'll respond to you. And I told him, if you do that, you know it's God speaking to your heart because you will feel it and you will know it. Again, you'll feel it and you'll know it. You'll feel it because the thought he gave you when you asked it, it's a thought that comes with peace. It may not make 100% sense, right? And even after giving you an answer, you may have even more questions, but you can feel him in that thought. You can feel his comfort. You can feel his presence. You can feel his security. You can feel his peace. Again, you'll feel it. But then I also told him, you'll know it. You'll know it because you'll know that the thought he gave you, it wasn't your own, right? The Bible tells us what? It tells us that God's ways, his thoughts, they're so much higher than our ways and our own thoughts. So, the, so God's answer to the problem you face, the question you have, it's most likely going to be very different than the approach or thought process you would go about to trying to solve that problem. Again, you will know it because the thought he gave you, you will know it didn't come from you. So I told him again, you will feel it and you will know it. That's how you know when God's speaking to you. And after that, very shockingly, he left satisfied. Like he was, he was good with that answer. But he left satisfied, not because he got the answer that he originally wanted, but because the answer that I gave him, he knew that it was enough. And I believe that he knew it was enough because I believe that's the way he's been wired. I believe that's the way I've been wired. I believe that's the way that you have been wired. You see, again, you've been wired to be dependent upon Jesus in everything that you do. You've been wired to live your life from this relationship with Jesus in everything. And here's the beautiful thing, you don't have to wait to heaven to experience this life that he's created you for. Because look, moments before he's arrested, 
Moments before he's rested, Jesus, he was praying for you. He's praying for all of his followers. He was praying to God and he says this, John 17, three, he says this. He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, that you may know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Again, think about this. Think about the words of Jesus. He tells us that eternal life, eternal life is not about a destination. Eternal life, it's not about escaping this world by saying a prayer in the quietness of your own heart. But Jesus himself, he affirms that eternal life, the life you were designed for, the life he created you to live is a life lived in intimacy, getting to know him. Because it's interesting, the word that Jesus uses for knowing this statement, to know God, It's one that's in the present subjunctive. That's just a really fancy way of saying that it's a knowledge that's always growing. It's never stopping. It's always growing, but it's not a knowledge that grows by getting more information. It's not a knowledge that grows by hearing the stories of other people. Jesus makes it abundantly clear it's a knowledge that grows through personal experience. It's a knowledge that learns to embrace your need for him. It's a knowledge that learns that even though you may not have all the answers, You're okay with that because the one you trust your life to, the one in whom you put on the throne of your heart, nothing goes beyond him. You know that he truly is the king of kings, but he's also your king. You see, it's a knowledge that grows by simply doing life with him. And with that church, I would love to pray us out. I wanna pray for a few groups of people. So if you go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes, let's all pray together. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth that you reveal in it. And Lord, right now, I just want to pray over our congregation that as we step into this new year, Father, that you reaffirm in us the narrative that you have for our life, that you show us the beliefs that we are supposed to live from. God, I ask that that you empower us to do that. You give us the faith to do that. You give us the faith to draw closer to you, Father, even the face of the hardest trials. So Lord, I just pray that over our entire congregation. But Lord, I also want to pray right now I want to pray right now for maybe someone who's never made this decision. Maybe someone who's never fully acknowledged and wanted to make you king and Lord of their own life. But they recognize their need for you. So if that's you and you're watching right now, I encourage you, just pray this in the quietness of your own heart. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I recognize my own brokenness. I recognize my own sin. But God, I also recognize the incredible sacrifice that you paid. The sacrifice that allows me to live out the life that you're longing for me to live, and that's a life in relationship with you. So Lord, I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I ask that you come into my heart. I ask that you be my Lord. I ask that you be my Savior. God, I ask that you shape me to be the person that you want me to be. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope that you were blessed by our time together today. As always, I want to remind you that you can continue the conversation by downloading the devotional we've prepared for you at CaptivateSD.com. We love you, church. Can't wait to be back with you next week as we start our brand new series, Unmixed. We'll see you here in person or online.